The following broadcast is brought to you by the friends and partners of Revival Ministries International. theme for this week is called Multiply, Multiply Card. Amen. And I want us to go to the book of Deuteronomy, if you would, please. And I'm going to read from chapter 8, and I'm going to read from verse 6. He says, therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat, barley, and vines, and fig trees, and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig copper or brass. When thou hast eaten and are full, and then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which the Lord has given thee, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments, his statutes which I command you this day. Now, in the Amplified Bible, it says here, verse 11, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his precepts, and his statutes which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten in a full and have built goodly houses and live in them, and watch this, your silver, your herds, your flocks multiply. Everybody say multiply. And your silver and gold is multiplied. Everybody say multiplied. And all you have is multiplied. Then your mind and hearts be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. One of the biggest problems, not only that face the children of Israel, but face even the people of God today, is that the moment the Lord multiplies them, they forget him. Israel had a relationship with God that was always coming out of bondage, cry out, the Lord delivers them, blesses them, then they forget him, then they go back into bondage again, then they cry out, then God delivers them, then he blesses them, then they <laughs> forget him, then they go back into bondage again. And you look the same way as in the modern church. You watch when people first come around the things of God, you know, and they're totally broken, busted, and disgusted, and, and then they ask God to help them, and then the Lord helps them, and then the moment the Lord helps them, you don't see them again. Well, pastor, we would come to church, but the Lord's really blessed us now. We've got a big house, and, and we actually got a yacht now. We're on the lake on Sunday, you know. Well, hey, when you didn't have the house and you had the shack down by the railroad track, you were in church every time the door opened, but now you've got this big boat, so you can't come to church anymore. So what does that tell me? You actually forgot the Lord. No, 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 but we just prosperous, and, and, you know, we work so hard now, and we just need a day over with the family. Take Saturday come around the things of God. It's very important that we honor the Lord. Are you with me? Somebody said, yeah, but we can go to church any day. But the fact is the people that say that don't actually go to church. Church is not just about going to church. Church is about fellowship with the saints. Are you with me? Church is about you coming together with the saints of God. I, told, I, I mean, I tell this story many times when we were kids, even when we went on holiday, my dad would drive around on Saturday, and I said, Dad, what are you doing? We're going to find a church. I said, for what? We're going to go to church tomorrow. And then we find this church, and we go into the church, and then the church has never seen any visitors, you know. It only got, so they think this is a new family that's unsafe, so they preach the best gospel message. 
<laughs> and because they think that our family's going to get saved. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, we all saved. You know, we have to hear this again, you know. So I didn't like doing that because I thought, look, just do what you normally do. We just come into church. But they, they pretended like we were, the, you know, sinners that needed to hear the gospel. So we had to hear the gospel again, you know. I mean, almost like you got, you got to tell them, listen, we're coming to church, we're all saved, we're on fire for God, so just do your normal thing. Don't change your message because we're the first sighting of a visit that you've had in like 10 years, you know. That was one of the reasons why when we came off the road back in 95, we, we, were, we were doing our meetings, we had changed the meetings, 95, 96, to finish on Saturday, we'd come home and I used to show up at churches here, and then, and then it was terrible because I'd walk in just to come to church, and they want me to preach. I thought, no, I didn't come to preach. I just came, I just came to sit in church. No, 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 you, you, if you come here, you're preaching. So then I end up preaching. So then I, so then I wouldn't go because it looked like I wanted to preach. And then if you just sat, then, then the pastor was looking at you, wondering why you were there. What are you doing here? Why are you coming to? I'm just coming to church. Well, what's your ulterior motive? Uh, church. And of course, the Lord used all of that to where we just, we knew God wanted us to start our own place, you know, so we could just go to church, you know. We don't miss church. We hear all the time. Except if we have to be in a foreign field, you know, it's hard to get back. I wish we could be translated. Wouldn't that just be great? You just, you could preach and pew, back home and we had church again and, pew, and you're off again. But the Lord knows he wouldn't let me do that because I'd just abuse it, you know. I'd be preaching in every time zone, you know. So it's so important that we understand that we must not forget God. Because the fact is this, it's not will God multiply you, he will multiply you. And it's just in the process of multiplication and increase that you constantly keep him first place in your life and you don't forget him. Not will God bless you? He will. Will you remember him when he's blessed you? Can you be trusted with the blessing? Because what people don't understand, when natural resources come to people, it's, it's like the anointing of the flesh. Because when you have unlimited supply, you know, you can buy, I buy that house, sell that one, get that car, sell that car. I mean, you get around people, their cars never get more than three or 4,000 miles on them. They always change the cars. They change the cars like we change shoes, you know. Houses, you know, they're always buying new things or whatever. And it's always like their whole life is caught up in, in things. And then you can't really talk to them because they are another realm, you know. So the moment you try to talk, bring a little correction, they say, well, don't you know who I am? No, in actual fact, I don't really know who you are. You're just somebody, you know, who has a bit of money, and now you're arrogant. I had a multi-millionaire, you know, they were having problems in their marriage. And so I'm trying to help. I'm a pastor. He said, I'm submitted, you know, he didn't even live in Tampa, lived somewhere else. He said, I'm somebody you can speak into my life. I'm supposed to be on an advisory board to help, whatever. And so they, I hear that they a major problem in their marriage. So I call up, what's going on? He won't even take my call. I thought, what? You don't have to take my call? Excuse me. Somebody said, what did you do? I rented a helicopter. And I flew the thing, oh, not me, I didn't pilot, I, but we flew the thing, landed in his backyard. <laughs> voot, 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 voot. Like him, and he comes running out, and I walk out of the helicopter, I walk up and go, you can't answer your phone. I will tell you this, it was the most expensive pastoral visit I ever did. <laughs> yeah. 
And how many know, when somebody lands in your backyard by your swimming pool, you, it's one thing when you pull up at the front of the house, you can lock the front door, but ain't nobody locking the front door. I tell you, that's why you, people don't know who the pastor is here at this church. I'll find you. I'll hunt you down. We'll come. I'll put a helicopter on your roof. Stop answering your cell phone. And, you know, I took them out, uh, fed them a meal, prayed with them, sorted the whole thing out. And they're still together all these years later. Very expensive pastoral visit. You know. But don't, don't tell me you're not going to answer your cell phone. I'll stick a chopper on in your backyard. I'll come find you. And it wasn't because I wanted his money because he hasn't given hardly any. I mean, I'm sure he gives something, but nothing, really. You need a calculator to find if they gave anything. So I wasn't there for the money. I was there for the restoration of the marriage. Because he already told me, he said, I would give more, but my wife won't let me. So, you know, okay. So he can't give anything because his wife won't let him. Well, then I'm not going to let that stop me from getting a marriage healed. Just because a wife wants to hold on to everything she's got. Amen. We don't do anything we do because we're going to get financially remunerated. We do what we do because that's what the gospel is about. Can you say amen? So we hunt you down. We'll hunt you down. There's no place to run. No place to hide. Some of you don't even realize you're being geotagged, just sitting in the seat. No, I'm teased. I'm, I'm teased. While you're here, we're putting a, a device on your car to track you. <laughs> Just teasing, teasing. But I will tell you, when you're watching online, we know exactly where you are. No, because we can go to the back end and we can actually, t- the latitude and longitude of where your house is is right on the web. We know where you are. Imagine somebody sitting somewhere and suddenly I've got a helicopter landing in the backyard. <laughs> I'm here on behalf of Pastor Rodney. He said he knows you're watching. <laughs> Everybody say multiply. multiply. How many believe in God for multiplication? <laughs> so God is a multiplier. From the beginning of creation, everything... God touches, he creates, he multiplies. Genesis 1, 27, 28, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said, be fruitful, multiply. Replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Fruitful means producing good results, beneficial, profitable, abounding, producing an abundant growth, and the synonyms for fruitful are productive, successful. Multiply means to increase, to reproduce. If you married here, have children, have more children. Have many more children to make many or manifold, increase the number or quantity of. The synonyms are accumulate, boost, build up, enlarge, expand, generate, proliferate, propagate, and spread. Dios es un multiplicador. Si. (laughs) <laughs> Everywhere he went, he preached multiplication. He was specific regarding multiplication and being fruitful and producing fruit. Look at John chapter 15 and verse 1. I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Any branch, everybody say branch. Not branch, Branch. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away, trims off, takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit. So 
That's why we have to look at our life and we have to see certain areas and we see, okay, this area is not producing, so let's cut it off. Are you with me? Who's ever uh, gardened with roses, has a rose bush? Okay. Now, my, I grew up with gardening with my mom and dad and, that, and they would have beautiful roses and my dad would go in there and hack everything to pieces. And I go, dad, what are you doing? You're chopping everything. He said, no, I'm pruning it because it's going to produce better. And you do that with certain uh, fruit trees. There's, certain, there's a pruning that takes place. Why? Not because you want to kill the tree. It's so that you can produce more fruit. So what we do is we look at what we're doing in our life. We take an assessment of our life. We say, is that producing? Even in ministry, in your business, in every area you're involved in, if there's things that you're doing that are not producing fruit, then you can't just say, well, I'll just believe one day it'll start to produce fruit. You actually have to go in there and say, okay, you know what? Maybe it's come time. We just need to cut this off now. We need to prune this. Which says painful sometimes. Think about the rose, you know, bush. Yeah, you chopping on the rose bush. The rose bush is going, no, no, don't cut that. Don't worry, you're going to look better when I'm finished. So he cuts away, trims off, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear, everybody say, more and richer and more excellent fruit. You are cleansed and pruned already because the word which I have given you, the teaching that I've discussed with you, which that's what happens. The word comes and prunes us. The word of God comes and cuts away that which needs to be cut away. He says, you dwell in me and I'll dwell in you. Live in me and I'll live in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in, being vitally united to the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. So, that's another thing to think of. Maybe what I'm doing is not producing fruit because it needs to be cut away or I'm not abiding in him like I should be because when I abide in him, I will end up produce fruit. I mean, it's impossible to abide in him and not produce fruit. So he says, just like no bronze can bear fruit of itself without abiding, being vitally united to me, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever lives in me, and I in them bears much abundant fruit. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. If a person does not dwell in me, he's thrown out like a broken off branch and withers. And such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire, and they are burned. If you live in me and abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. One translation says, ask whatever you will. If I don't have it, I'll make it for you. And then look what verse 8 says, so powerful. When you bear, produce much fruit, my Father is honored. Come on. Mucho fruto. Mucho fruto. When you bear much fruit, my Father is honored and glorified, and you show and prove yourself to be a true follower of mine. So let me ask a question. How can you say that you're a follower of Jesus and you have no fruit coming from your life? It is impossible to call yourself a follower of Jesus and have no fruit. And, and I know that sounds like I'm putting pressure on people to produce fruit, but let me just tell you, we can take anybody from any walk of life, no matter how hard things have hit you, and within three years, there's going to be fruit coming from your life. If you listen, if you listen, fruit will be produced from your life because we'll show you how to connect with him. And, and if, he can, if you connect with him, he connects with you, then fruit's going to come out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And you're going to produce more fruit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory a Dios. So Jesus preached multiplication. Jesus. Jesus. Predico multiplicación. Yeah. All right. I'll get it. I'll get it. (laughs) 
<laughs> the, the five loaves and two fish multiply. So that means it's not that you have to have the multiplication. You just have to have what you have in your hands, and then he breathes on it, and then it multiplies. As you're obedient to him, it multiplies. So say this after me. I must bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. When I abide in him, I'll produce much abundant fruit. When I live in him, when you produce much fruit, the Father is honored and glorified. And you show and prove yourself to be a true follower of His. That's what I always am looking for in my life is, is more fruit. And so you have to be truthful. You have to be honest. Uh, you know, and some people, they want to stay in faith. How you doing? Praise God. Everything's just wonderful. We believe in God for breakthrough. Yeah, but there has to be fruit produced en route to your breakthrough. You can't just believe him for your breakthrough. And when the breakthrough comes, then the fruit will be, there must be fruit. You have, you have to see little fruit. There must be small fruit. Might not be the big harvest that you believe in God, but there should be little harvests. Are you with me? Otherwise you see people and then five years, they no fruit. Well, wait, I'm just standing believing God. No, 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 no. You, obviously, there's wrong thinking. You've got wrong thinking. Your thinking's messed up. Come here, let's sit down. It's not that hard to bear fruit. It's not that hard to bear fruit. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to produce, to produce fruit. It's simple. Anybody can produce fruit. But people go through a lot of religious stuff, religious mumbo jumbo, and then they praise God, just believe in God one day, some way, somehow, and then 10 years later, still no fruit. No, no, no. If you haven't seen fruit after 10 years, it's time to go back to the drawing board. It's time to say, okay, okay, we've got a problem here, and somebody needs to show me what I'm doing wrong. Look, it's like losing weight. Okay, lo yeah, somebody said, great, you go pick on losing weight. No, no, I know, I know because I've lost weight. I lost 170 pounds. So why would you go learn from somebody who's never lost any pounds how to lose weight? Are you with me? Yeah. I mean, if, I'm if I was still 346 pounds telling you how to lose weight, you go, oh, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Look like you had one too many muffins, you know. No, I'm telling you from, from experience. I know what you have to do. So you want to get around people that actually know what you have to do. And then, and then here's the thing too. So then you get a skinny person who's never been fat telling you how to lose weight. Shut up. You have no clue what it is to lose weight. You've never been fat. You have no right to even open your mouth. I would never listen to Pastor David on how to lose weight, ever. Because there's no fruit of losing weight in his life. He's just skinny and always has been skinny. And then he tried to put on weight. He couldn't put weight on even if he tried. He could eat a whole chocolate cake and, not, and the, the scale would be up two ounces. If I just walk by a buffet line without even touching, it jumps on everywhere. I mean, I, it's like the craziest thing. One, one bowl of tres leches, it's finished, finito. Who likes tres leches? So you look for people that have had fruit in the area so you can learn. You, you go ask somebody how to make money in business when, you, when the person's been you know, bankrupt 30 times and they're still bankrupt. You, know. you can learn from people. Most people that go through those processes, I mean, I think Colonel Saunders from Kentucky Fried Chicken was bankrupt three times, but then he became a success. So you didn't want to meet him when he was selling chicken out the back end of a Studebaker. Are you with me? 
But you wanted to meet him later on when Colonel Sanders and Kentucky Fried Chicken was everywhere in the world. You can go to remote parts of the world. You go into the desert and there's a camel and there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken. So you go and learn from people that have produced fruit. It's very important, and, and especially when it comes to the kingdom of God. Don't go learn from somebody how to have a good marriage and they can't stay married to the current husband or wife they have or hate their spouse. I really need help in my marriage. I, well, you know, don't talk to me. I hate my wife. You know, yeah, this, the fruit there is going to be wrong. Hello. You'll spend three tea parties with that person and then you'll be divorcing your husband. Why? Because their influence is going to be there for failure. Why is it getting so quiet, you know? That's why it's important that you don't go around and just sit around and talk to people that aren't doing stuff or just disgruntled people. That you, you, you sit around disgruntled people, people that are angry, people that are hurt, whatever, they're not going to help you. Do you understand that? Those people are not producing fruit. There's no fruit coming from them. They're angry, they're hurt, they're sick, broke, busted, and disgusted, and you're not going to get anywhere. In actual fact, most of the time, all you're going to do is talk about the problem. They're going to talk about the problem. Three hours later, you both want to jump off a bridge. Busy people have no time to sit around and criticize and, and, and angry and whatever. In actual fact, if you meet somebody busy, basically they say, I don't even want to hear it. I don't want to hear it, please. I'm busy. Sorry. They don't want to hear it. La, 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 la. I do that often. People come, they want to tell me a whole, so uh, excuse me, sorry. They don't want to hear. Don't know. Don't want to know. Boy, get quiet here now. Because you'll spend hours sitting around talking to people that are doing nothing, and at the end of the day, your whole day is wasted. There's no fruit coming from your day. That's why I don't spend hours on the telephone. Some people will talk to you for four hours on the phone. You, you know, if they've got four hours to talk on the phone, they've got nothing to do. So normally when I call people and I know they're chatty, I'll say, I have two minutes. And they go, I have two minutes. And then we get to the point and tell them I love them and off the phone. Otherwise, you'll be on the phone for, for days. Getting very quiet here now. I'm a, I must be dealing with some real specific things here. And I'm not talking about somebody that doesn't communicate. I've, I've, I've nearly 2,800 people's names in my phone. So the texts will come through at all hours of the day or night from around the world or whatever. And I'm, I'm more of a text person. I'm not somebody who can get on the phone for hours and talk because you're busy. I do talk on the phone, but most of the time, I, you know, we'll just sit there for hours talking about nothing. You know, you'd be succinct to the point, you know, one, two, three, amen, because a busy person is a busy person. Why are you looking? When you have hours to update your Facebook page about where you are, and posting pictures of your food. <laughs> Nobody cares about your beef and bean burrito. <laughs> well, maybe they do. All right, I'll move right along. I see that went over like a lead balloon. Now, let's look at the uh, parable of the talents from Matthew 25. Let's go there. Parabola de los talentos. Matthew 25 and verse 14. 
For it is like a man who is about to take a long journey. And he called his servants together and entrusted them with property. And to one he gave five talents, probably about 5,000, to another two, to another one. And each in proportion to his own personal, personal ability, which this is very important. Listen, I don't know how to stress this today. God will never put things on you that you don't even have the personal ability to do that. So sometimes we expect things from people that they don't have the ability in the natural to do that. A person who's educated as a medical doctor, in, as a surgeon, is someone that you want operating on you, not a motor mechanic. Are you with me? God is not going to tell you to do something that you're not equipped to do. That's why we need to equip ourselves. We need to learn. We need to study. We need to learn. That's what RBI is about. Are you with me? I'm talking about for spiritual things. But we need to learn other things. There's many other things. I'm always studying all kinds of things. Why? So that I can know how it functions not because I'm going to go do that, but I want an understanding of how the thing works Amen. so you can deal with people. Amen. So I love this. It says to each in proportion his own personal ability. So people get mad because somebody else got more than they did, but they don't realize what they have, and they're not interested in multiplying what they have because what they have is smaller than what somebody else has, and they're disgruntled because somebody else has more, and they can't understand why God gave them more, and they got little. Don't get upset. Just take the little you got and multiply that. Act like you got more. And God will increase it. He received five talents, went and won and traded them and gained five talents more. And likewise, he received two talents, also gained two talents more. But he received one talent, went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money, which that's what people do. There are many people that have talents and gifts and abilities and you never see it. They hide what they have. These people that have great ability to sing, and, but they won't sing. They're not going to sing. There's people that have great ability to do certain things and no one will ever know that talent or that gift that they have. And trust me, there's people in this room that are very, very talented, but you never use your talents for the kingdom of heaven. Everything we have is to be used for the kingdom of heaven, to multiply for the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, I must really be scratching in somebody's kitty under the box yet today. You know, what's your talent? What is, what is what God's given you? Somebody says, yeah, but pastor, it's very small. It's just one. I don't care. Do not bury it. Take it and multiply it and use it for the kingdom. Because the day is going to come back where he's going to ask and require of you what you did with what he gave you. And then you can't blame it on other people. Well, I tell you what, if they'd have just opened the door for me and if they'd have just made a way for... No, no. You had your eyes on people. You didn't have your eyes on the Lord. If I hear this all over the place. Ministers tell me, boy, if they'd have just opened the door for me, my ministry would be in a different place. I thought, you don't even understand. God's the one that opens the door for you. If I had waited for doors to be opened, we wouldn't even be here today. We had every door shut. In actual fact, people blew the house up so there was no door. You know, we couldn't even, I mean, there was no door. There wasn't even a roof. I just wouldn't even let it affect me. I just said, you know what? They can say what they like. I'm not here to be liked. I'm not here to, I'm not, you know, I'm not here so they can think something of me. I'm here to obey God, to do what God's called me to do. I'll go preach. People laughed at me because we would go into a meeting with 30 people and I would preach like there's 10,000 people. I had somebody tell me now on Wednesday night and he said, hey, he's a top singer. 
He said, my, he said I, I sang in your meeting in the Holiday Inn in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There were 18 people in the, in the place. I said, yeah, and I preached like it was 10,000 people. He said, and it was a great meeting, 1988. He said it was a great meeting, let me tell you. But there were other people in the room that were laughing at me because I was up there preaching like, my God, I'm taking America. You know, there's 18 people in the place. I'm up there preaching like, hallelujah. And there was my one talent. Here I am, and I'm preaching the gospel, and everybody's going to get saved. Everybody's going to get healed and delivered. And here I am today, I'll do the same. I don't care. It's got nothing to do with the crowd. Some people, if the crowd's great, then they on a high. And if the crowd's a little low or whatever, then they get quick, quick, you know, we'll just be quick because there's nobody here, whatever. I've never, we have never, ever, ever done that. We always went out and gave our best. And oh, it didn't matter if the crowd was a hundred or the crowd was 10,000. We always went out. If I'm in the mud hut in Western Zambia with 200 people, I give the exact same thing if I'm in some arena with 10,000 people. We don't hold anything back. And I've been with ministers. They go, look, hurry it up. I mean, there's nobody here. No, no, be quiet. I'm ministering now. I'm not coming here to give half a job. I go to the Arctic and preach to the Eskimos. I give everything I have. Amen. Multiply. Everybody say multiply. multiply. So the one with two, he multiplied. The one with one dug a hole. What have you buried? What have you buried? What have you stuck in a hole? That's your talent that God has given you. It's time to dig it up and to multiply it. So the master came and he required of the servants to settle the accounts with them, which that day is coming. And he who had received five talents came and brought five more, saying, Master, you entrusted me five talents. See, I gave five more. And the master said, well done, you Upright, honorable, and admirable, and faithful servant. You've been faithful and trustworthy over little. I'll put you in charge of much. Enter into joy and share the joy, the delight, the blessedness which your master enjoys. And he also, who had two talents, came and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. You have gained two talents more. And his master said, Well done, you upright, honorable, and admirable, and faithful servant. You've been faithful and trustworthy over little. I will put you in charge of much. Enter thou into the joy and delight and blessedness which your master enjoys. Then he that received one talent also came forth and said, Master, I knew that you were a harsh and hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gather where you had not. So suddenly he's got one talent, but he's now angry with the master. Instead of realizing that he could have taken the one talent and multiplied it, he's mad really probably because the other guy got five and the other guy got two and I only got one, so therefore I just buried what I had instead of taking the one that he had and multiplying. He said, I was afraid. And he said, I went ahead, the town of the ground, and here, have what is your own. I mean, just like, just totally ungrateful. Just like, here. I had one preacher tell me, he said, now I didn't want to repeat the public. I couldn't believe sitting in my house telling me that the Lord should have done more for him in the ministry. And I should have done more for him in the ministry. And I should have bought, bought him a car and should have opened some doors for him. And he was mad. Because he, he felt like his ministry never went anywhere. And I got up there from behind my desk. I said, don't come sit here in my house and start running my heavenly father down. I said, God didn't hurt your ministry. I said, you the one can't keep your zipper up. Don't come, no, please. Let's talk it out plain, bro. Come on, seriously. You can't keep your zipper up and then you want to blame God because your ministry is not going anywhere. Somebody said, you didn't say that. Yeah, I did. It's the truth. Start blaming the Lord. God is not your problem. God is, as for God, his way is perfect. You know, and here's the thing. If you, if you blow it or miss it, then don't, 
Don't get angry and then get mad at somebody. Just repent, cry out, ask God to forgive you. He's gracious. He will come. He will forgive you. He'll restore you. And you can begin again. But don't go bury the thing. I've said this many times over the years. I've seen people restored from every kind of thing known. Moral failure, financial improprieties or whatever. The thing that's probably the hardest to restore people from is false doctrine. Because the, 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 the doctrine of the word is the anchor and the stability for the house to be built. So if you don't get them back to the foundation of the word, what are they going to go? They're going to go back to more false doctrine. Are you with me? Because if anything goes before, every, anything goes afterwards. So it's almost like you have to come, bring them in, deprogram them, tell them everything you believed is a lie. It's all fake. It's all a lie. Do you understand that? This is what you believe is a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. You're willing to give that up? Yes. Okay. Then come here. We're going to put you through Bible school. It'll take you a couple of years. We're going to deprogram you and get you back on a foundation. That's the word. And then you, be, you can be restored. But normally when somebody's flaky, when it comes to doctrine, they're going to just stay once a dingbat, always a dingbat. And there's nothing you can do with that. Over the years, we've seen people come here. Some have been arrogant, and, and we couldn't help them. Others have been humble. We've been able to help them. We had, we had somebody came here, wrote a book, phenomenal book. You know, they put a lot of study into it, but the book was wrong. And I sat him down and said, your book is false doctrine. It's, it's not even true. You know, they didn't get mad. They said, Pastor, you know, whatever. They scrapped the book. They scrapped the whole book got rid of the whole book, and then the Lord gave them another book, and that book has been a blessing to thousands of people around the world, and they never got angry. I thought, you know, they could get angry, storm away, leave the church, and what? They said, this book is finished. From this day, the book, I'm throwing it away, and they were just humble, just teachable, and now the Lord's used them in a powerful way to literally impact millions of souls. Are you with me? But they could have got mad. They could have got mad. I wrote this book. Yeah, I know, but it's not in line with the scripture. And I just said, this is what the scripture says. This is what the book says. Okay, then the book needs to go. Didn't get upset. Humble. So, so I was afraid and I hit. And the master said, you wicked, lazy, idle ser servant. Did you, intend, did you indeed know that I reap where I had not sowed, I reap where I had not sowed, and gather grain where I had not winnowed? Then you should have invested my money with the bankers at my coming, I would have received my own with interest. So take the talent away from him and give it to the one with ten. So that shows you right there, God's not into socialism, where he is into the redistribution of wealth and takes away from the rich to give to the poor. God's not, that's not how the kingdom of heaven works. The kingdom of heaven works that when you're faithful with a little, you become ruler over much. So that means God's going to increase you. So don't come with this theology that, the, you know, I had all this, I came to the Lord and God stripped me away to have nothing. Because that's just nonsense. And it's not even God. Why would God want to take everything you have away from you? For what reason? Like God sitting in heaven thinking, you know, let me see what I can take from them. I'll take it. Let me see. I'll take everything from them. And then you say, well, I'm just like Job. I said this, I believe, last week. Job's problem was nine months. Nine months. That was his, he lived 210 years. His problem was nine months. And then the Lord restored to him and gave him twice as much as what he had. You so you talk to the people with the theology that they like Job. How long have you been like this? 30 years. Bro, <laughs> you're not like Job. In actual fact, the devil doesn't even know that you exist. Because if you know anything about Job's story, that God was actually bragging on Job. And said to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? So if there's any reason that Job got into trouble, was because God kept flagging him. You know, God kept bragging on him. Like, yeah, God, be quiet. Don't tell the devil anything. You know, shh, don't mention me. Don't leave me alone. You're putting a target on my head, you know. And God said, have you, look at my servant Job. Look how. 
And then we know that Job opened the door. The thing he greatly feared came on him and he kept sacrificing on behalf of his children. But nine months later, man, God restored him twice. Amen. So, are you getting anything out of this here today? So this is very important. Muy, muy importante. Amen. Amen. And so he says, for everyone who has will more be given and he will be furnished richly so that he will have abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken from him. And throw the good for nothing servant in the outer darkness, there'll be weeping and grinding of teeth. So we're running our race. Our race is to multiply what God has given to us. Amen. Not to look at what somebody else has been given. I cannot live my life based on what somebody else has been given. And then I'm upset because they haven't given to me what they have. Because God's got something special for me. And God's got something special for you. Can you say amen? amen. Now, one of the things that is of the utmost importance, and I want you to understand this here today. And let me say this. How many home group leaders or the HOJ leaders we have here today? Wave your hand. Wave your hand. We, we, no, come on, do a better job then. All the HOJ leaders and the two RCs. Everybody in, in the home groups, in the HOJs, wave your hand. Wave your hand at me. Okay. So how many know that we believe in God to multiply our houses of joy? Now, so I want you to listen carefully. You know, you can take people and raise them up as a leader, and then you can put pressure on them. To You need to raise up six HOJs. They don't have it in the ability to do that, but they could, they could raise up one or be a part of one and be a strong part of one. So what I see people doing is putting pressure on people to do stuff that they are not able to do. That's not what we want to do here at the river. Are you with me? Why has it gone quiet here now again? Is this camp meeting or what? Now, this is important because one of the things that I realize as pastor here that people are people, people have their lives. They have to live. They've got to, you know, you've got to take care of your wife, your children. You've got to feed your dogs. You've got to mow your yard. You've got to go to work and all that kind of stuff. I understand that people here, part of this ministry, you're not full-time in the ministry. It's one thing if you were full-time, then that's what you would do full-time, but you have to do other things along those lines. You, you've got to live life. Are you with me? So I want you to know, as pastor, I'm not the one putting pressure on anybody because we, we have a whole motto here at the river. If you have to force something, it's not God. If you have to force something, it's not God. And the fact of the matter that people have to live their life and they have to be involved in their life. I, that's why I don't want you wrapped up in church seven days a week. Except this week. <laughs> no, I don't want you wrapped up in church seven days a week. You need to be working your job. You need to be earning a living. You need to be spending time with your wife. You need to be spending time with your children. You need to be spending time in fellowship. And here's the first thing. For, before we even build the houses of joy, we win souls. There you go. So, so the number one thing, that one thing we do, we win souls. How many soul winners do we have here? Okay. And then the goal is to establish the place where people can be discipled. So rather than me tell you you have to disciple the whole city, can you just find one other person that you disciple? Just one, just one other. I'm sure, I'm sure that that's not putting too much pressure if I just ask you to multiply yourself with one other person that you make as radical on fire as a worshiper, giver, soul winner, other than yourself. Just one other. So I know that, I, you know, because one of the things I keep telling all our pastors, we can't burn through people. We can't burn. It's impossible to burn through people. I run it at, at a crazy pace. I run, you know, it's 18 hours plus a day. You can come to my house at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm walking around in the middle like you think it's midday. We, and the pastor, Eric and Jennifer, the same way. And we got others that are the same way. We're always working. When we're awake, we're working. You know, get up, you, you're busy functioning, you're operating. Even when we're on a holiday, we work, we're working, you know. 
And, when, and a busy person can do more in one hour than, than a, a person can do in a 40-hour week. You just, you're able to do it. You know how to manage your time and you know how to accomplish things. Are you with me? So I'm not here to put pressure on you that you, I want everybody here that has a H or J, you need to have six new houses of joy yourself. Look, just build a strong one. And, it, and here's the thing. When you build a strong one, just one, just one, it'll multiply. It will multiply. A healthy, healthy cells grow. Healthy cells grow. Are you with me? And what I really want to see is that it jumps across the street to another house, then it jumps across down the road to another house. That's organic growth that I'm looking to see, not, you know, hey, we got like 40 new home group leaders and we need to find a house to go put the people in. No, we've got to win our neighborhoods to Jesus. We have, we have 134 houses now already across the city and it's only beginning, let me tell you right now, but you watch the next 12 to 18 months, that's going to be 240. 240 homes, and then it's going to be 480 homes, and it's going to be organic growth just as people begin to multiply, as God takes you and multiplies you. And you take your talent, your gift, your thing that God's given you, and you let him multiply you in that regard. You're going to reach people with that talent that I can't reach. So this is important that you understand that. And I want you to know, I'm not here putting, we're not trying to grow some big mega church here so that we can, everybody can say wonderful. Because ultimately, I've seen all those churches grow up and explode and then blow up. And I've seen them all come and go. There are churches that we went to 30 years ago that were the major church. There's not even 300 people there anymore. There were thousands 30 years ago. There's not even, some of them don't even exist. The place is bulldozed to the ground. The pastor's dead, died a long time ago. So all of that stuff comes and goes. So we're not even looking, I'm not even interested in that. I'm looking for fruit and the fruit that we're looking for is eternal fruit. So, so here's how we're going to really know that we produce fruit. When we get to heaven, that you have stuff to show for your life on the earth. Are you with me? You've got eternal fruit that's waiting for you. Not get to heaven. Well, Lord, I had 10 HOJs under me. Yeah, but son, nine of them went to hell. Yeah. No. I mean, this pastor, I got 20,000 members in my church. 18,000 of them are not even saved. Imagine getting to heaven and 80% and of your church never even made heaven because you didn't even preach the word. That would be so embarrassing. Imagine get to heaven and then, Lord, you know, and then the Lord said, yeah, none of your people made it because you were too, you didn't preach the word. You didn't preach the full counsel of God. You were too afraid that you might lose some people so you never spoke the truth. So yes, we want you to multiply. Yes, we want increase. Yes, we believe in God. God's going to raise over 100 millionaires. I don't know if they made it out this morning. Okay. But ultimately, ultimately, when all that's said and done, we want all of you in heaven, number one. We don't want you in your pursuit to these earthly goals that you miss your heavenly reward. Because then I failed, and then my fruit is all up the creek. Are you with me? How many understand why this is important that I share these things with you? Because life is not just about living in the now. It's about what's going to count a hundred years from today. When, when we started this church, the Lord said, have a place where you can prepare the people for eternity. I mean, thank God, my dentist is here today. And they're probably here because I haven't been in a while and I, they come to show up here to, that I need to make a visit. I know, I understand. I could see him looking. You haven't been around. I know, my dentist is here. But the day will come, my friend, when you'll never clean another t tooth again. I can promise you right. You'll never fix another tooth because when you get to heaven, nobody will have tooth decay. Just so you know. So I'm just letting you know, your job is a really a temporal job when you think about it. Need it, but temporal. 
No one's going to sit in heaven and go, ah, 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 ah. His name is Agnini. We call him Dr. Agony. <laughs> and he runs at you with three syringes. And then you can't talk properly because your bottom lip hangs down. And they always want to have a conversation with you when everything's numb. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. They always want to have a con. So how did that trip go? Well, that's just great. <laughs> Drool coming down the side of your mouth. <laughs> let, me, let me get that <laughs> while you drown. <laughs> <coughs> Let me get that. <laughs> now it's needed. Who needs a dentist? Oh, people are raising their hands. There's many people need a dentist. Who likes to go to a dentist? Oh, of course you're going to do that. You're part of the business. You love it. It's like a people conduct a funeral home. And they love funeral homes. They love coffins. I love coffins. I sell coffins. We sell gravestones. So here's what I want to say, and I'm going to close with this. We want to take our natural talents to multiply, to bring eternal fruit about. Are you with me? Because if you don't attach what you're doing in the natural to eternity, then you come to the end of your life, and in, in the natural you have really little to show. That's why I tell people, you know, God raised you up in business or whatever, then use your business for the funding of the gospel, putting your resources into the kingdom, amen, and letting God increase you like people were over, this, over the years with, with what they were giving God was so big they decided to live off that and give God the rest because the multiplication was so great. So this week we're going to deal with a lot of things, and, and I guess what I want to really encourage you here today, you that seemingly have the one talent or it seems small what you have, to not bury what you have, take it out right now, polish it and begin to multiply it for the kingdom. Do not allow the people that have five or two to be intimidated to you and you think I'm not really worth that much because I don't really have that much. You know, my talents are so small. No, you take what you have and you multiply it for the kingdom, no matter how small that it looks. And I'll throw one more thing out here. The Bible talks about producing 30, 60, and 100 fold. Everybody wants 100 fold. You know, somebody says, well, a thousand times more. You couldn't even handle two times more. Are you with me? So the fact is people talk about multiplication, but they're not even ready to receive a multiplication. Multiplication brings about problems. It does. You're living in a one-bedroom house, and you have triplets. <laughs> You've multiplied. Are you with me? Suddenly now you've got three kids... Hmm? You can do triple bunks, you know, but you got three. You went from one to three. So suddenly that creates another whole set of things. Suddenly the car that you're using is not big enough for the three. Well, you could have six kids. How are you going to carry them around? I met a family with 12 children. 
You know, they have their own football team. <laughs> Multiplication brings problems. It does. Whatever you have that's multiplied, it's going to bring about a whole other set of problems. Could that be why some people don't want to multiply because they don't want to handle the problems? Hmm? Could that be? Could that be the reason why most people keep themselves and you look at this whole thing that's come about, everybody's going to live in these small houses. Have you seen that? It's like tiny little houses. It's like you can't swing anything in it. Like the smaller the house. People have gone crazy. Anybody saw that program on TV where they all shrink the house down? You lie in bed and take your foot and open the front door. And they're close. I mean, like a tiny little teeny thing. Now we downsize it. Well, hey, why don't you just get yourself a coffin? Why don't you just down, well, get this coffin and just live in a coffin. And put, close the lid and get up and go about your daily life. And then close, you can get a double coffin for you and your wife. Your car, it might not be the nicest car on the planet, but look after it. Clean it. We come to your car, we look in there, there's papers all over, hamburger wrappers, cat hair. I'm believing God for a new car. I pray you don't get it. I pray you don't ever get a new car. You're not even looking after the one you have now. Yeah, look at my car. My car's what going to cross 130,000 miles. And I keep it like it's new. If you look at it, you think I bought it yesterday. No, we keep it clean. We keep it new. And if it's broken, you fix it. Why? Because you want to look after what you have. I have one vehicle with over 200,000 miles on it. Look after what you have. Everybody wants a new wife. Look after the one you have. <laughs> I just wish my husband, no, look after the one you have. This is helping everybody, yeah. And be happy. Be happy. Don't walk around and be miserable because, well, what's the problem? Well, I'm not there yet. You know, none of us are there yet. <laughs> Who has some big dreams and some big visions? And want to, How many know you're not there yet? But at least be happy along the way. There's nothing worse than hanging around miserable people. Be happy, be joyful. Stop and smell the roses. Look at these flowers. Look how beautiful these flowers are. These are real. We don't have any fake on the platform. Real flowers. Stop and smell the roses. Take time when you leave here, just look at the trees. Take time to look at the sky and appreciate just everything. Take time to listen to the birds. When else did you hear a bird? I'm not talking about the bird sound on your cell phone. Because people are always trying to get somewhere. They're miserable.
stop and appreciate what God has done and be thankful for the little things. Be thankful for the little things. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So say this off to me. No matter how small the talent is I've been given, I will multiply it for the kingdom of God. And I'm happy with what I have received because what I have received has been given to me in proportion to my abilities, my talents, my gifts, and the grace that's on my life. And I know that as I'm faithful to take this small thing and multiply it, that the Lord will increase me. I don't want any more than I can handle. I don't want any more than what the grace can carry me to keep. I don't want anything that's going to crush me. I want to go from glory unto glory. And it's for his glory anyway. And so I want to hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And so, Father, right now, I thank you for the talents and the gifts that you've given me. I dig them up. If they've been buried, and from this day, I will multiply them for your eternal purposes. And on that day, I will hear these words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I thank you for it now. In Jesus' name. Now, one more thing. When you realize that this is the precursor to eternity, then based on what we do now will be based upon what he allows us to do then. Are you with me? Somebody says, yeah, but we're going to go to heaven. Yeah, but there's some big things that's going to happen in eternity. And based on your life here on the earth will be given to what area he allows and gives you authority over. Are you with me? So whether somebody said, well, nobody recognizes what I do. Forget, there you go again. Forget about what they recognize. Somebody said, well, nobody's even appreciated what I do. Forget about who is it. If no one recognizes, if no one appreciates, he's watching. And he even says what's done in secret, he will reward openly. And the day will come when you will be rewarded. I can promise you. I can promise you, you'll be rewarded. And so on that basis, then I prophesy over every single person in the sound of my voice that even in the remaining months of 2018 shall be multiplication that shall be upon your life, your marriage, your children, your grandchildren, your business, your ministry, and everything that you touch will multiply for the eternal purposes of heaven. And your life shall be a blessing unto many. And you shall not only be sustained, but shall sustain others. And you'll be a blessing to your family. And you'll be a blessing to those in your neighborhood. And you'll be a blessing everywhere you go. For the hand of God is on your life. Hallelujah. 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 And say this, say, Lord, Lord no matter how you bless me, no you bless me I, promise you, I promise you, I will never, never. I will never forget you. I will always keep you number one. Now just lift your hands and thank you for that right now. Hallelujah, 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 
Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Natural, natural. I see natural multiplication. Families that have been believing God for children, I see they're coming. Grandparents that have been believing God for grandchildren, I see they're coming. Property coming into your hands. Land coming into your hands. Multiplication, increase. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for watching today on YouTube. Please press the subscribe button and also the notification button and like and get the word out so others can watch.